kid. Seriously. <laughs> Star Wars in Review podcast. The only pair of folks on the internet not currently suing the president of the United States. Over yet. there, yet. Over there, that's why I said currently. Over there, we have Luke Neitzel, whose broomball exploits have resulted in delusions of grandeur. And over here, it's Maya Madrid, who is very fond of the color red. Every so often, we get together, discuss the news going on in the Star Wars universe, answer the emails that kids seriously got, and do a deep dive into the episode that we're currently watching in the Clone Wars. Serious, Luke, how are you? Good, and I pioneered the, the butterfly style for the Intermural College Broomball League. No one, no one was doing that until I brought it to it, and I won Told four you. titles. So uh, what's going on with you, dude? Oh, oh man, I've had, I've had something of a week. I spent most of the week of last week and then the first half of this week thinking that we were about to move to Portland, Oregon. Whoa. Because my job really wanted me to, and we really wanted to for a little you bit. You should have. Why are, you're stupid. All of a sudden, we did a cost-of-living comparison and oh. really <laughs> <laughs> realized realized what a good deal we have here in Milwaukee yeah. as far as uh, the, the cost of housing, specifically, wow. versus the cost of housing and the quality of education. So uh, we decided to put a, uh, put a cork in that and, and just remain here. But it was a whirlwind week. It was exhausting to think about. I'm glad that wasn't my family, because crap, she was just gone with it. She was just done it. She loves Portland. She's been there. It's like the only place she's ever been, and I think that's the only place she'd ever want to go. Or Denver. One of those two. Yeah, we love the Pacific Northwest. So they, And I think they knew that, and that's why they dangled it for mm -hmm. me, is because they were like, oh, we bet we could get them to do this or whatever. And I, <laughs> the I was, Timbers are here. They got I, a chainsaw. Exactly. I was all ready for it. Uh, but then, the, you know, if we, if we didn't have kids, I'd be packing right now. Yeah. But... The logistics of it and uprooting their lives and the cost and all that just just didn't make sense. But that is a, a lot to put on your plate and think about and have to worry about for a week and a half and stuff. So I made our we made our decision Tuesday and I went to bed at six o'clock. Wow, <laughs> I was so tired of thinking about it. Wow. Uh, for me, you know, it's a week and a half without soda, and uh, one of the things I've been supplementing. I got my coffee here, and I'll take you know a coffee into work. And that's pretty much all the caffeine I had. But one day, I had, in the afternoon, a double espresso little, like, Starbucks thing. Yeah. I didn't know the kind of punch that that had. That's like, you know, like, the first time you drink vodka or whiskey. <laughs> and I actually had, like, panic attack. Oh, really? Yeah. That like, gets your heart going. Like, so I was like, there was, like, people around, and they were, like, talking, and it was, like, vibrating my eardrums. And it messed with me so bad that I actually ended up having... Um, like ringing in my ears for two days. Seriously? So like, I need to like lay off. The well, that means you didn't drink happens. enough. You should have had two. <laughs> I guess you're right. It would have balanced it out. I guess so. Should we get to the news? I guess. Luke, you and I have been critical at the lack of diversity within the Star Wars universe uh, in leadership positions, and we've both been campaigning for more opportunities for women and people of color. A few days ago, Disney announced that Victoria Mahoney would be the second unit director for J.J. Abrams on Episode 9. And while she doesn't have a ton of experience, she's known for her debut, Yelling at the Sky. Now, Luke, I've heard that a second director is really important to a shoot. I've also heard that it's not so important. Help us parse through whether this is an important hire or not and tell us if it's a good sign or merely a patronizing move to get people off Disney's back. I'm not going to say that them hiring a diverse candidate in any role is a bad thing. But I'm not going to cheer loudly and say they've done it because they did a second unit director, which is a lot of B-roll, a lot of exterior shots, a lot of things that the, the first director, Abrams, in this case, doesn't have time to do, so he entrusted to a secondary person to do. So it's an important role, but it's not, it's not the same by leaps and bounds of putting someone in charge of directing a movie. And I, I don't think you can blow as much smoke as they have about wanting to be diverse and then expect that to be a bone to anyone. So it's it I'm good for them for hiring her for that position, but it means nothing if that's all you do is hire, you know, B-roll directors or, you know, second assistant directors and, and whatnot. So let, let it's you, you got enough stuff on your slate. Pick pick someone else for your next movie. Don't just go to the same pool that you've been doing. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, I think that's it's it's going to be all talk until there's a director that's a woman or a director that's a, 
non-white male. Yeah. And uh, and until then, I think they're going to keep it in the same critiques and and I think it's deserved. You know, you, you can't say that you're for diversity and then not show it in when it at the big jobs. And that's one of the problems I think of this country is you know corporations will say they're diverse but there's definitely a glass ceiling and i think we've seen that so far in star wars and we're going to keep on hitting it until well let's hope that because uh weiss and Benioff aren't directing Mm -hmm. and i'm not sure how many more films there are to add in there if we're talking you know possibly three from them and three from from ryan johnson the last one in the saga episode nine and then possible han solo sequels so Benioff and weiss this is your shot, especially as two people whose previous hit has been critiqued as being very misogynistic. Mm. This is kind of a double whammy win if you can pull it off in there to rehab a couple different images. I, rehab, I don't think is the right word because, but but to but to actually do this for a change, that's your spot. So you know, go find the best director out there possible. I'm all for that, uh, but but make sure you're looking at all the candidates and not just not just picking a woman to pick a woman but going out there and finding really good quality directors out there that are women that are minorities because we know they're out there making you know have ryan ryan coogler's movies what the ninth highest grossing of all time and still going so don't don't tell us that you know minorities can't make great movies or that movies that focus on minorities oh they never tell you that they would never tell you that they would never say that no, but they, they can demonstrate it to me mm-hmm. that they understand that lesson. So hopefully that's where we're going with this. Hey, in strong arm tactics of big corporations news, which is the longest intro that we've had, uh, Amazon Prime members are the only ones who can buy Blu-rays or DVDs, at least initially, to Star Wars movies. In addition to Star Wars new releases, the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies are also included, at least some of them. Luke, Amazon has done this before with movies like Birdman, but are they risking unleashing the fury of Star Wars fans, which we know can be fierce, or is this much ado about nothing? It's much ado about nothing, because they'll still be available on the other platforms. I mean, they already, if you buy digital, as a person who buys physical DVDs over digital... Most of the time you do. Yeah, exactly. Digital always comes out sometimes a month earlier than Mm -hmm. the physical DVD, so you got Last Jedi and you don't even like it, you got it a couple mo- or a month before I did because mm-hmm. I waited for the DVD. So it's no different than that. Amazon, everyone has Amazon. It, Amazon's easy to get. I don't think this is a big deal at all. We see these type of deals. But, you know. All right. Yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't bother me none. I got Amazon Prime, so what up? Yeah, I do too. So. <laughs> Man, this is a high-energy <laughs> show. Consider the sauces. We really brought our enthusiasm we did. today, didn't we? Yeah, uh, finally, TV spots have begun to drop for Star Wars, or, uh, excuse me, Star- Solo, a Star Wars story, giving us a few new scenes and new shots, including some more on the bond between Chewie and Han. You and I have talked a lot about your feelings on trailers, and I'm wondering if you've seen any of these new spots, or if not, if you can explain to the people at home, our fans, your views on how much is too much before a movie. So I haven't watched the TV spots. I just watched the first two trailers, which is my general rule of thumb, which I got from my buddy Jim. Who doesn't watch any trailers? So hi Jim, you why, listen now. So why are you? Why is he? Why do you always bring him up? Because I miss him when he's not around. You know, and the funny thing is, is we were scheduled to record yesterday, but my my son had a concert and you spent that I had to go to. Well, you're no, a son of a bitch. I didn't see Jim at the concert, you but after the concert, him. I went to his house and we oh, hung out all night. So dick. that was pretty fun. So wait, what was the question? Oh, well, what's too much? You know, for me, I want a feel of the atmosphere, especially with characters I'm very familiar with. Like, I, I know when you say a Han Solo movie, when you say Spider-Man, when you say Avengers, I know who those characters are. So give me just some glimpses, some tastes of some sequences to let me know what kind of the, the style and the rhythm is. But I don't want major funny reveals, major jump scares, major plot details. The worst example is Spider-Man Homecoming, which almost laid out the plot beat right. for beat. I mean, there were some stuff at the end that was that was not in there, but the whole boat sequence and Iron Man saving him and all those type of things, they kind of laid it out how it was going to go. A good example, I think, to stay with Marvel is Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which the majority of their trailer was all that opening sequence where they're fighting the the monster that's really kind of irrelevant to the story. Mm-hmm. I don't even think Kurt Russell was even in those trailers. I don't believe so. I could be wrong. So you got 
you know, you got to see the reintroduction of characters you love. You got some exciting action sequences you knew they were going to be in, but you didn't know what was going to happen in the movie, what the villain was really about. So um, another good example, I think, right now, and it's only one trailer in, is Ant-Man and the Wasp. Because we don't really know what the plot is off of that, and we got maybe one image of a villain the whole time. So with a movie like Star Wars with Han Solo, who we're very familiar with, don't don't give me really much plot at all. Just just give me some kind of the basics and atmosphere. Do you want me to spoil anything for you, or do you want me? You to can because I don't really care that much about this one. Okay, so they're sitting at the the table, the gambling table, right? Sure. And Han's got looking at his cards. And he kind of slides them over. Like, this is the way that it ends. Like, it's it's like some new stuff and some old stuff. But Han's, like, looking at his cards. Like, a real tense moment. And he kind of holds his cards up over at Chewie. And Chewie, like, leans over and takes a look and just goes, oh. <laughs> and then that's it cuts good. out. So, it's... I, I just... I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah. All so right, the, that's great. This is my question about this movie. Yeah. How many different origin reveals are we going to get? Because... We already saw it. We're going to get the reveal of him meeting Lando. We're going to get the reveal of him winning the Falcon. We're going to get the reveal of the Kessel we, Run. We don't know that we're going to get We're it. guessing. Yeah. We, we, we know we're getting the reveal of how he got his blaster. Yeah. You know, so are we going to get the reveal of his his vest? I'm really nervous about if that's done I, I properly. Like not, I feel what like about not being the serious. scar on his chin? Are they going to finally explain how he got the scar on his chin? I'm just like you're not being I'm so worried if we don't origin story every aspect of this character that I won't understand him as a person. So please tell me that I find out exactly how he got every single part of who he is. Yeah, I totally can't really give a shit about that. I just want a good movie. And, and and really, if they if he had just had the Falcon and Chewie had just already been there or maybe he knew Lando, none of that stuff would bother me. Um, I just want it to be good. Yeah. And I don't care about any of that. And then, like, I, I, I don't want it to be overdone as like this ode to just finding stuff. Like the, the blast That's what was I'm... a little much. Yeah. You know? Well, and it made me think of uh, in X Men Origins Wolverine how they showed us how he got his leather jacket, as if anyone gave a shit about the leather jacket that was Wolverine had been wearing. Leather, that was cool leather jacket. Yeah, that's great, stripes. but were three you, stripes like his claws. I think it's a fantastic Jackman, and Hugh Jackman wears the shit out of it, and that's great. But at no point during X Two was I going, God damn, I wish I knew where he got that jacket because there's got to be a fascinating a, story about it. Was he wearing it? I don't know if he was. Wearing he might have been. Jacket. I don't know. He was wearing it in the first one. I don't know. Last one, too. Hey, uh, speaking of last one, uh, that's the last of the news. Let's move on to emails that kids seriously got. Hey, a new name. Yeah. In our newest segment, which is entitled, as I just said, Emails Kids Seriously Got, we explore emails that kids seriously got and that have been sent to us by viewers and fans and people all over the globe. Luke, as we've discussed, we have had to change our perfect name for the segment, Serious Questions for Kids Seriously, after we found that Screen Junkies were using the same name. So in honor of the first segment, with a new christening, we happen to get no emails. Pat, where are you? <laughs> Jed, where are you? Chill Pony, anybody? Are you out there? We need you to email. Maybe Jim will email. Maybe Jim should email. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you would read that one with giddy fervor. Well, it'd be a good question. All right, let's talk about the Clone Wars. All right, before we jump into Clone Wars, this has been a super low energy episode for us to start from and a little disorganized. And I just realized just now that it's because you haven't slapped yourself in the face. That's true. And we I just, usually slap we, myself in the face. And we did just pause and you now slapped yourself in the face. We're going to bring it. So rip roar. We're going to bring it. From this moment on. So Season 1, Episode 12, The Gungan General. Mm-hmm. Fail with honor rather than succeed by fraud. <laughs> In this episode, we see Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Count Dooku all wrapped together, captured by the evil pirates, and only one man or Thing. alien can save them. It's uh, it's your buddy Jar Jar. Take it away, Luke. That's right. It's a Jar Jar episode. So yeah. we start out on this one, and I was very confused when this started out, because as we last left them, yeah. they tried to drug Obi-Wan and Anakin... But they force swapped their cups with other people's cups so that the other people drank the drug and passed out. And they were hanging out as we faded to credits. 
But apparently that didn't happen. Or and, they just got or they, drugged later. <laughs> yeah, or, or they just got hammered. Right. Because when they come to in this episode, they've been captured because they were drugged. And they are three-way tied up with Dooku on a glowing lasso, which is <laughs> something. Uh, they wake up in their cell, and they decide they have to work together. I think this is my favorite part of the episode. Not so much that they, oh, you have to work with the bad guys, because that is cliche by this point. But the fact that I genuinely didn't see it coming. I did not see Dooku and Obi-Wan and Anakin being both, or all three captured. I figured it was either going to be duping Dooku or duping the Jedi, but not, like, duping them both, which I... Yeah, that was my it's a bold plan. I don't know what they were trying to accomplish with know. it. You're going to bring the Republic and the Separatists on your ass. Just just piss everyone off right. um, and, and see see what happens, I guess, is what they were going for. But there isn't a lot of loyalty among those pirates, which we're about to find out because Hondo's men are going to go meet Representative Binks, who for some reason is entrusted with this, even though everyone knows he's incompetent. I blame Padme. I mean, really, you have to... A leader is judged not just on their leadership, but on the plans for the leadership vacuum that follows them, okay? And that's true throughout history. And Padme, when she left, left this this vacuum that was filled by Jar Jar Banks, and we're supposed to believe this. And this is, like, supposed to be a real episode that we're supposed to care about, and it's driving me crazy. Yeah, it was it was pretty pretty questionable decision. They do send another senator, Senator Karos, with who is supposed to be in charge of the mission. Uh, but as they are coming in, it's some clones, Binks, and the senator, as they're coming into atmosphere, some of the pirates who are supposed to meet them decide they are going to betray everyone, kill the representatives, and just steal the money and take off on their own and leave Hondo there with his hostages and no money. Or as they refer to it, Spice, in this they're, episode. They're drugs in yeah. the Star Wars universe. They're drugs. Oh, okay. Hey. It's a more adult show, I suppose. So they go and they, and shoot the ship down, and there's some Mr. Magoo, Jar Jar, bumbling where he keeps getting ejected into the cockpit and okay. sent back down, and the senator has to unbuckle himself to buckle Jar Jar in, and then uh, they are hit, and the senator isn't able to buckle himself in properly, so they crash and he dies. Yeah. So it's Jar Jar's fault, because yeah. he's an idiot. Because yeah. he can't buckle his own seatbelt, yeah. basically. But, but hold on, but hold on, because he's going he's gonna to bring it all back. He's going to make up for everything that we saw in the movies. Yeah, and we won't even care that that senator's dead by the yeah. end, because too many wacky hijinks will have improved our mood. Back in the cell, Dooku and Obi-Wan and Anakin keep escaping and then just keep getting caught and immediately sent back to their cells because apparently we didn't have 22 minutes worth of episodes. It's so like my kid when she goes on timeout. But yeah. She, she's not ready to be off timeout and then gets put right back on timeout. That's what I thought. That was Obi-Wan and well, Anakin. And it happens the first time and I went, oh, that was kind of dumb. They're wasting time. And then it happened the second time and I was like, well, now you're just all idiots right. <laughs> that, are, that are running into each other. So they, they keep continuing to do that. And Hondo taunts them and teases them. Meanwhile, the pirate... This is another great idea with the Dark Jedi and the other Jedi and just mocking them. In addition to, like, capturing them, you should just piss well, them off. And it, it, may, it makes you wonder if this was a, a reality. You know, Dooku... Hondo goes in there and it's just him multiple times with them. And it's like, Dooku could just force choke you to death and walk out of there. And basically, in the end, when they eventually do escape, it is the, just them using the force to open the door and walking out. <laughs> but it, it's kind of a, a mess, them constantly trying to escape. And then there's points where Dooku's dangling from his rope and Anakin wants him cut off, but Obi-Wan won't do it. And it's a real kind of carefree, bumbly, Scooby-Doo type vibe of them escaping. Meanwhile, on the planet's surface, the clones are being attacked by these renegade pirates who just want to steal the, the spice. And th this is the one thing that I liked, is they were on these kind of hover motorcycles. The, swoops, the pirates, yeah. yeah, that looked really, really cool. So they have kind of a battle with them that starts out pretty interesting, and they're, they're fighting back and forth. And then, basically how that ends up ending is they tell Jar Jar, the clone troops tell Jar Jar he has to go negotiate <laughs> with them, which they're I think they're just trying to buy time, assuming he's going to get killed. Except for one of them who, I'm not sure if that was Rex or not, because he was bald like Rex and he had the two guns like Rex, but he had a different color armor. But he's like, oh, no, don't worry, he's more capable than you think, which there is no reason to believe he is remotely capable of anything. You just really want him to die. He's the, just, the yeah. clones are just the audience. Yeah, I mean, I have, 
if I didn't know better, I'd half expect them just to shoot him in the back of the head as he was walking up to the thing just to be done with him. And we would have applauded and applauded. We would have. And he, what happens is, is they're like, okay, we'll capture this guy and we'll ransom him off too. Even though they're not trying to ransom anyone off because they broke off from Hondo, but whatever. That's a minor point. And then he goes into full Magoo mode, bumbles his way around whatever tank they put him in, and he ends up blowing up all the other tanks and beating all those pirates. And and the clone troopers and Jar Jar are able to advance. Meanwhile, they have separated Dooku from Anakin and Obi-Wan at this point. Dooku's in a cell by himself. Obi-Wan and Anakin are being hung and tortured electrically in the bar area while everyone laughs. <laughs> And it was great, like, bar time. You know, like, I love going to the bar and watching an important game, or love going to the bar and watching a band, but going to the bar and seeing Jedi electrocuted is, uh, that would be up there for me. It'd be big in Texas, I bet. Right. <laughs> but they, uh... Everything's big in Texas. Exactly. They're getting basically electrocuted to death, but Jar Jar's antics with blowing up the tanks also runs into the power generator, which cuts off all the power. And the two Jedi are able to fall in, and Wait, then they're... that's so convenient. I know, and then their lightsabers are conveniently there, too, so they're able okay. to get their lightsabers okay. back. And now suddenly they can take on the pirates, and it's no big deal. Meanwhile, Dooku just uses the Force <laughs> and opens his door and strolls kills, out. Kills some dudes. Yeah, he ends up walking towards one of those sweet flying saucer ships that the pirate use, and the two pirates that betrayed him, betrayed Hondo, are there, and Dooku violently murders them. And it, yeah. it's interesting because we've talked about juxtapositions because this is kind of a wacky, bumbling episode. Mm -hmm. But it's not only that he lifts that guy in the air and uses the force to snap his neck, but the sound of it snapping, it's the exact same sound, I'm pretty sure, that they use in A New Hope when Vader kills that guard on the, um, on the blockade ship. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a brutal, gruesome death and gruesome sound. So it was very odd, but at that point I was cheering for everyone involved with this to die, so I was I was okay with it. <laughs> and then he gets in his ship and speeds off, and the Jedi are like, oh, we'll go get Dooku, and then they see it fly, and there's kind of the wah, wah. Oh, he escaped again. And our episode comes to a close with Hondo and the Jedi making some type of treaty because they have honor and aren't just going to murder him even though they murder everyone else the Jedi do and Hondo really respects that even though he betrays everyone left and right yeah it doesn't really it doesn't really follow through the theme doesn't really make sense when you no, carry it, to the carry out the... they wanted Hondo to be in the series cuz he's going to be in it for a while so they just threw that in as to explain why the Jedi just didn't kill everyone in that place and then leave or send a republic battle cruiser in to clear out those pirates so they leave with kind of the eerie, oh, but Dooku knows where you live. Well, here, yeah, well, okay. Can we make the argument that this is kind of Obi-Wan Kenobi's style? Like, just assuming that Anakin is going to die there on Mustafar, he just walks away. And then just assuming <laughs> that Dooku's going to handle Hondo, he just walks away. Like, maybe this is like some character flaw well, of Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know, there could, be, there could be something to be said, I think, realistically. Because I do get your point there is very <laughs> correct and good. But I think there could be something to said that... That the Jedi do kill a lot, but that maybe Obi Wan doesn't isn't going to kill someone who isn't an immediate threat to his safety. Yeah. And at that point, the pirates have kind of given up, so he's not going to just execute them where Anakin would. And Anakin wants to, and Obi Wan tells and when him he no. Does in the movies, it's awesome. Yeah, so so I think they probably could make a, a good argument for some of that stuff. The problem is, is tonally how they deliver it and how they do it. It doesn't fit into any of that. That's a lot of me extrapolating other things I've seen in the Star Wars universe. So I think if if that's what they were going for, they could have done a much better job of making that point rather than me having to try to make those clues to make this not be the worst episode possible. But this episode sucks. Yeah, it's It's not funny when it tries to be funny. It doesn't really seem like it's going anywhere. It's just kind of wasting your time for 20 minutes to get to the end. The Dooku working together with them I, I can see that concept on paper sounding interesting but what they do with it is not interesting it's them tied together on a lasso falling off of stuff and getting recaptured constantly so i'm not sure what they were really going for if they were going for laughs i think they were but then they have some really gruesome and violent deaths that come with it too that throw the tone off I, sometimes i would this episode in particular i'm watching it and i i try to say to myself my son would probably like this episode. That's what they're going for. 
and then they strangle people to death and you go well i don't know if you'd like that or they you know the jedi are screaming as they're being tortured and electrocuted and you're kind of like i don't know if a little kid would go with that so i'm not sure where the balance is but i don't think they're hitting it i will say i remember when i was a kid a second or third grader and i was watching voltron and sven died Mm -hmm. and that was one of the moments that i was like holy crap this is the greatest show of all time like it when it really got real and and for you you've talked in the past about transformers the movie and how they all die Mm -hmm. and the effect that had on you and and then like uh gi joe the movie when cobra commander turns into like a literal snake oh yeah don't they stab duke too yeah they do (laughs) stab duke so you know, those moments, those adult moments for kids, they really burn in the memories. Maybe that is what they're going for. Maybe they are trying to scar them, the psyches of our children for... Uh, yeah, I just wish they the could moments. make it flow more together so it seemed more coherently happening. You know, like the the Sven death and the, the Transformers death fit the tone of what's going on there. Like, they're still fun and they're still action-y, but it felt like it made sense. Where these just seem like violent shifts back and forth. Do you think they're just hoping that the parents aren't watching at the times when it shifts to the dark side? Yeah, I, I don't know. Or, or I know I think they're doing that to appeal to parents. Because, I mean, there's people like us. People that yeah. grew up on Star Wars that are going to watch these shows, even though they're technically kids' shows, because we just love the mythology. And I think they want a more serious adult tone for people like us and let's be honest if they didn't do that if it was just kind of a wacky kids show we wouldn't be doing this right now right. we wouldn't be going through all of them so i get that i just feel like if you watch other movies other kids movies because you know think about even all the classic disney movies when you rewatch them they're really dark and, and brooding and horrible things happen in them but they don't just seem like these weird quick juxtapositions of Silly, goofy, no consequences, wackiness to just gory oh, death. I, th- I think Snow White does. I think you go no. back, Snow White, you got like, the dwarves like, hopping around, and you got the evil like witch poisoning apples and stuff. I, you know, some of that stuff. <laughs> some of that stuff does get See, that maybe I give a pass because I feel like 90% of that movie is terrifying, and they just throw the dwarves in there to give you a few minutes of levity before they yeah. do something else I, horrifying. I would agree with your assessment on that one. So this is uh, this is not one I would rank high. Again, the highlights for me was I enjoyed the the battle sequence with the the hover bikes and the clone troopers before Jar Jar got involved in it. Yeah. When it was just kind of a battle sequence, I kind of like that biker gang feel that they were putting to it. I thought it fit those characters really well and was something that we haven't seen necessarily in in these movies. But it was that was good. Um, Minus that, I don't think there's much I'm going to praise. Yeah, I think Jar Jar Binks is the albatross that around the neck of this series that drags this particular episode down to the bottom. For me, out of the 12 episodes we've seen, I rank this as, as 11. It's no coincidence that um, the one that's ranked the lowest is Bomb Bad Jedi, the other slapstick Jar Jar story. These people are trying to get me to care about Jar Jar. And, you know, I'm sure they... They're like, well, how can we make Jar Jar like more of a hero? Because he was a little bit muted... Uh, compared to what you thought he was going to be, but he was still lame. And I think they thought, okay, we're going to make people care about Jar Jar now, and we don't. What I think would have been nice, and maybe we'll get there, but I don't have a lot of faith, there are a lot of seasons left, is you have Jar Jar and the Phantom Menace, which is really, really reviled by most people, and you can tell that Luke has picked up on that because he moves way, way to the background in the next two movies, but he does have a pivotal part in the history of Star Wars because he's the one that goes in in Padme's place and votes that they turn everything over to Chancellor Palpatine, the Emperor. So I would have liked to see them try to steer him over the course of the show in a direction where maybe we can try to rationalize why Padme would do that. Show him grow up, mature, not be just this bumbling, fall-over-everything character to the point where... We can justify what happens in Revenge of the Sith, but if they're going to continue down this route, then it's just another stupid character, and they made stupid decisions, and they put him in charge for no reason, just so that he could turn power over to the Emperor. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but to do that, you'd have to have more episodes about Jar Jar, and I'm, I'm <laughs> really not looking forward to that. Yeah, but you I know... have a life. I have things to do, <laughs> okay? I, and, and I love watching this show, and when the good episodes are good, they are great. And I enjoy it, but I did not enjoy this. The problem is, is you know they're coming. Right. Like, there's no way this is the last we've seen of him throughout the show. So if we're going to have to see him either way, 
I'd at least rather see a take that tries to redeem him. Yeah. In the same way that I think the only thing that we can say redeeming about him is in, I'm not sure which new canon novel it is, where he is basically like an ostracized street performer slash beggar that everyone hates because they know he's the one that basically helped bring the Empire did to they, power. Did they, or was, that a, was that a rumor? I, I, I believe that I was in a book. I need to read that book. It's you do need cool. to read that book. What's your problem, man? Was it in future know. tense or whatever you don't like? Future <laughs> present tense. Present you tense. <laughs> okay, what grade did you get in English class, you dickhead? We had English class? Yeah, we did. So this would get, uh, I'll give it a, a pew just because it's better than Bombad General. So one Laura Dern pew blaster at it. I spit on this episode and never want to watch it again. Yeah, it's it's bad, and it's disappointing because normally the second half of a two-point part arc has been some it's of been the best great. stuff we ever get. Yeah, it's been awesome, and this was such a disappointment because I was like, all right, coming through, going to happen again, and then it was just, just didn't. Yeah. It made me long for the days of the malevolence, let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah, because those, those were boring, but at least they weren't stupid. They right. were just boring. Except for those whales that you really hated. I did not like those those whales. Manta mm. rays or whatever they were. Speaking about things you do like, other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Oh, I have so many things to pick from. Mm-hmm. I, don't even, I don't even know where to start. So, I bought a new TV and I'm really excited about it. And I it, it's bigger than my old TV, so I'm getting a thrill out of that. And I watched Rogue One again, so I got to see everything kind of on a much bigger screen with better sound than what I was currently doing. And I had a couple thoughts while I was watching it that I I was going to ask you about. Because is it possible that you have the three best individual battle types of the entire Star Wars mythology in that movie? Because I think it's hands down the best space battle that we have in Star Wars is that the battle at the end uh, above Scarif. What is what is number two for you? Space battle? Yeah. Uh, I would probably go with the second Death Star yeah, space battle okay. at the end. Okay, we're sure All right. Um, I, I keep going. I, Sorry. I, I'm sure I'll get ripped on. I do really enjoy the space battle at the start of Revenge of the Sith. Yes, no, well. I think that's awesome. I think that's number three for me. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we're on the same page. Yeah. Um, as far as... I but I don't know if this... I would have to go back and see if Rogue One is better than Return of the Jedi. Oh, it is for me. Because um, I love Return of the Jedi. Like, I can... I'm pretty sure that I can picture it frame by frame nice. in my mind and go through it. Um, but I did love... It, but I was distracted in Rogue One because they kept having B, B footage from, like, old pilots. Yeah. And that, like... I was like, whoa, whoa, what the hell? What the hell's happening? So I got to... Well, and I think and, that like, plays into part of the reason I like it so much is the way they were able to integrate it into kind of New Hope. Mm-hmm. Like, with that, you know, you see Red 5 blow up because we all know who's going to be Red 5. Right. And having some of those pilots that we're familiar with from A New Hope with that old footage, I thought was a really cool thing that I wasn't expecting. Awesome. Yeah. So it just led to more of the fun during it. And I, I've i seen that battle sequence. I, well, I watched it a few hours ago, and I still think it's it's the best the one. The hammerhead part where it's like pushing the Star Destroyer is... Oh, and then the two beautiful. Star Destroyers collide, and yeah. then crash into the shield gate. And I that movie, I, I absolutely love that movie. And then, so next I was thinking, is there a better lightsaber-inspired situation than Darth Vader mauling down all those people in the corridor? I think there's a lot of arguments you can make for some other ones, but man, I love that sequence where he goes through and and kills everyone, and they they don't even stand a chance against him. I mean, Phantom Menace um, is, I, I think the lightsaber duel at the end with Phantom Menace is one of the the best things that Star Wars has ever done because they've got the music, the duel, the fates. You have Obi-Wan seeing his his uh, master killed right in front of him and is powerless to stop it. You have a great sort of climax in that situation where he's barely hanging on and does like the flip and the lights, you know. Yeah. Um, well, and Darth Maul is such a great presence. He's the coolest character design for me that Star Wars has ever done. Right. I love how when they're trapped in those energy shields how he just paces and stares at him like a tiger at the yep. zoo does. Absolutely love that. So that that sequence is great. But I think you might be right. Well, and I then... was so like I was so choked up when that was happening in the theater watching Vader just do all the things that we wanted Vader to do on screen 
and the, the the sheer terror in the rebels' faces, like that was awesome. Just an unstoppable force. That is what we wanted to see in Revenge of the Sith, and we didn't get. Mm. So that that lightsaber sequence. The other one I would mention, and I don't know if this is going to set you off or not, but is Ray and Kylo Ren fighting the Straight. Praetorian Guard. Straight. Yeah, that that would be up there as well as far as a lightsaber battle for me. Um, visually, it's just stunning and amazing. But those that one and Phantom Menace are such different ones from what we saw with Vader and Rogue One. I also really like Return of the Jedi at the end. I know like when Vader actually falls down, it's kind of like a hokey moment. Like if you actually go back and watch Vader falling down at the end of Return of the Jedi, yeah, it's, he doesn't, he shouldn't fall down. It's just like clearly staged. It looks like a bad wrestling move. But the emotion behind it, how he's like Vader can read his mind and then picks up on the sister and like, fine, fuck you. You're not going to join me. I'm going to find her and she'll come over to the dark side. And Luke just like going right up to the edge of the dark side and how pissed off he is. And then the way that it ends with him throwing his lightsaber. Like Luke, I've always said to you, Luke Skywalker is the best when he's not fighting and then when he's sort of doing the Buddha thing. And uh, so I put Return of the Jedi out there as well that ending with the music the music is great too if you go back and listen to it um but i think you might be onto something with uh vader here and and that's and you know just another on return of the jedi it's it's such a great battle without being it just being a visual spectacular because the other battles we're talking about are basically more visual spectaculars where the battle in return of the jedi is spectacular because of the investment in the characters and what the characters are going through it's more of an emotional yeah. battle than just the physical flips and and stylizations that you can throw in there. So yeah, that that is pretty good. But yeah, and then the third thing I thought about is just a ground battle, ground battles between what's happening on Scarith, which I think is a really good ground battle sequence, and my favorite one might actually be the assault in Jetta City, mm-hmm. where Sagarera's band attacks the the stormtroopers and uh, Jin. And Cassian are just caught in the middle. is a really great battle sequence. So, I mean, you could have three or four of the best overall battle sequences of the entire franchise in one movie. You know, the big, the big, the big hit against this movie is that people have to say that they either say that it slows down in the second act, or they don't like the first and second act. And I have never been able to agree with that. I have been riveted every single time that I've seen Rogue One. And my wife actually turned to me after the last time we watched it, and we watch it probably once a month. And she said is this not your favorite Star Wars movie? Like, I know you love Empire Strikes Back, but how much of that is sentimentality? How much of that is Kirk Gibson in the 1988 World Series? Because this movie, when Jin puts her arms around uh, Cassian and the whole thing's blown up, like, it, I know everybody says the, the best moment in Star Wars might have been Vader. Like, you can make the argument that that's the best moment. Like, this is a movie about sacrifice, and all the other movies are, have all these great themes, but, like, these people gave everything. Like, Luke Skywalker didn't give everything, you know? Like, Han Solo didn't give everything to the Rebellion. These people did. And I don't know. I just, I don't understand no, how people hate this movie. There's a lot of, like, I think it's beautiful. I think it's, I'm so happy Gareth Edwards was so cool about doing the reshoots and that they fixed this thing and they made it. I think, you know, all of Disney came together and made a wonderful film, and I kind of want to go back tonight and watch it tonight. You you should. Like I said, I did it today, and it, it's great. And it, it, I might, it might be my favorite. It's definitely 1-2 with Empire, but you're right. It might just be the, the little kid attachment to Empire that, that puts it ahead. But this movie kicks ass, and yeah. I, I absolutely love it, and I'm... Do you feel... People critique it and say there's not enough character development, and, I've, and that's something that I never had a mad. problem with that. I... I love the arc of Jyn Erso. Um, I like Cassian and where he's coming from. He's been, he's been, uh, he was part of the Separatists. Like his family yeah. part of the Separatists since he's fighting since he was seven. So you watch him; he's on Dooku's side. Who's you know, and, and obviously Dooku is working with Sidious, who's the Emperor. But um, for the people who supported the Separatists and hated it, the Republic becomes everything that they thought it was. They thought it was an a. a brutal government that really wasn't responsive to the people and guess what they were right and to see cassian like go the whole route i mean are the separatists the real rebels yeah i for me what i what i would have done just to improve the pacing a little bit and this is a very very minor complaint is i would have i would have not shown us riz ahmed's character until they find him in the cell so i just would have cut out him being transported, him meeting 
Forrest Whitaker, because I don't love Forrest Whitaker's performance in that movie, and I don't like the mind-reading slug thing, and I don't think any of that stuff really mattered. So I think if you would have cut some of that out, it would have improved the pacing a little bit, and we still would have, we wouldn't have lost anything from a story aspect. I I would agree with you up to a point. I would cut out actually the middle section, but I would show him arriving at Saw Gerrera's, um, because I think that moment is so full of tension. I mean, it's like, it reminded me of like, this dude is like going to essentially what some people would consider like the Osama bin Laden of the Star Wars universe, like this crazy zealot. And he's going in trying to convince him that he's, you know, trying to help him. And like I, the tension in there. And like, you look at the aliens that they chose to make for that scene. And they're just like, they're just, it's just menacing. It's just scary. And so I wouldn't want to lose that, but I could totally agree with the mind, the mind melding alien or whatever the crap that was because yeah the thing didn't even matter it just felt like they threw a special effect in he could have just told him exactly and he would have he was there to tell him right and then just create some piece of evidence that would make him believe you know yeah i mean i think they were trying to give us some tension that you know if Jin saw saw would he even recognize her or would he just be the some type of crazy old man that would kill her but i don't think that tension really stuck it didn't it didn't it doesn't like i mean you get the feeling that's going to happen but within 30 seconds or within actually shorter than that 10 seconds any of semblance of that tension is gone yeah. you know it turns right into you know you were a kid and i raised you and i did what was best for you and she's like double you know double birds at him like fuck you for <laughs> leaving me and uh which is like, cool i don't know i didn't i don't hate forrest whitaker like you do so he can be very good i was 100 percent his oscar behind his oscar win but for the most part I'm, I'm not a fan so and i don't think that performance is is great and i think less of it would have been more yeah. So, so that's my thing, even though that's not really other section, but I was just so excited to watch that today. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, I've been listening to a podcast called Case Files. Have you have you listened to this? I have. It um, is one of the coolest. I, I really like true crime. You really like true crime. And it's one of the coolest podcasts that I've listened to. It's long form sort of stuff, which I get into. And it's got like this Australian guy who like sounds like he's right on the outback. So to hear it, it's interesting because you're hearing him talk at least in the first two episodes that I listened to about American crime and sort of talking about American topics and getting most of it right. But like, you know, like he called a judge a magistrate. <laughs> so sure. that, so it's like, that's not right. Australian <laughs> guy. Um, but really cool, true crime stories that are written in long form. And, uh, and no really one knows enjoyed. who he is. Really? Yeah. I didn't know. No, that. he doesn't put his name on anything or attach it. So he just puts out this podcast and nobody is entirely sure. Who he is, so there's a little a little added bonus mystery you can dig into, too, trying to figure out who that guy is. Maybe it's Mr. Sunday Movies. Do you think about that? It could be. It could be. That'd All be awesome. my worlds colliding. It would be awesome. Hey, uh, well, this is, uh, speaking of colliding, uh, we're about to collide with the ending of this episode. Luke Neitzel, all these people out here, they're wondering, how do we get a hold of Luke Neitzel? What are they going to do? Well, once a week I check my Twitter, which is at Luke underscore Neitzel. And I checked it today, so, you know, you, you, you got time to, to bother me with stuff because I won't probably check it again until next Friday. For me, I'm Maya Madrid, which is at Maya Madrid, all one word. And oh, and you know what we should probably say because we never say it? The email address so people could email us. Or that our actual Twitter handle is at Kids Seriously, too. Oh, that's where yeah, most of the stuff actually, actually is. actually comes out, at yeah. Kids Seriously. It's not really at us because we just do our own thing. Yeah. It's at Kids Seriously. And by the way, Kids Seriously Radio at gmail.com is how you can send us those emails that I know that you're dying to send us. If you've liked this episode or even if you haven't, hit that subscribe button, get us to 11. Woo. We are out. Hi, Jim. <laughs>